Well, hello and welcome to episode number 292 of the Plain Talking UK podcast. I'm Carlos and joining me here in the PTUK studio this week and uh, he's looking so prepared, it's, it's not even real this week, it's Matt Smith. <laughs> How very real, I'm, I'm, I'm terribly offended by that, how dare you? Honestly, he's, he's <laughs> on the ball tonight. Yeah, absolutely. He's been here since 1am this morning. Getting yeah, ready absolutely. For I mean, work is for, you know, weird people. The coach uh, has been yeah. on autopilot all yeah, day. Pretty much, yeah, um, absolutely. No change there then. Yes. School kids, <laughs> yeah, 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 okay. yeah, it's, it's alright, you're fine there, it's half term, it's all good. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, the kids are on holiday. They are on holiday oh, this yeah. week. Absolutely. They get more holidays than we, we do. Uh, they don't, they don't get as many holidays as you. I think we should go back to, to school. Go back to school. Mm. Right. Okay. I mean, I wouldn't recommend it, given that you know, <laughs> you're now a grown-up and that's probably frowned upon. Uh, uh, but uh, anyway, on, anyway. on, on that uh, yeah. bombshell. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, how, how, how are your things? Uh, yeah, fine. As I say, it's been a bit of a quiet week. I was I, I did a little day trip to Colchester on Tuesday. That was nice. Uh, no, no, no. Oh. Actual Colchester. Oh, okay. Uh, if you're ever in Colchester, by the way, the castle is very much recommended as somewhere to visit. Absolutely beautiful. Um, and uh, we were lucky because the weather has been, well, frankly, rubbish this week. Um, oh, yes. But it was very good. Good. Yesterday we had uh, on Tuesday. Sorry, it was all sunny and, and everything. A really nice day. So yeah, all good, all good. Uh, what you, you've been up to? Not a lot this week. It's been a really quiet week. I've, I've um, been been office space doing a lot of warehouse stuff this week, which is nice because, as many of you know who watch the show, that our offices are on an old B seventeen base. So it's quite nice to sit up there and look across the runway and kind of just chill out, really. And, well, mind you, a few days it's been rather overcast, but uh, it's been quite relaxing. It has been week. very overcast. But yes. uh, I've had a, I had a special treat um, uh, this week. My boss very kindly uh, got me a nice Mercedes to mm. drive yes, we around had a in. Jolly out we in did, it, we? Yes. yes, absolutely. My my yes. boss Stuart very kindly um, um, went out and got me a Mercedes X Class for, for a week. Yeah. <laughs> um, as you do, uh, as you do, um, yeah. because it's just a treat for me, you know. And um, I thought it was very nice. And we, we, me and Matt had a little jolly out in the, we the did, other evening. Yes, uh, it's a nice, lovely vehicle. Yeah, I would. I mean, lovely vehicle. You know, I mean, if my boss got me one, I wouldn't say no. No, no, no. So if you're listening, Stuart, thanks for that, mate. It's been awesome having that this week. <laughs> um, I've got back to the old. Tri- Star van now, oh right? dear, um, you're slumming it now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right, okay. Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, moving swiftly on. Uh, joining us this week, as always, uh, across the uh, across the fields and the dales and the vales, in his stately manner in oh. Buckinghamshire, it was of course the awesome Neville Bounds. Evening to you and everybody. Yes, it's been well. Whilst you two gentlemen have been slacking this week, <gasps> how uh, rude! <laughs> faffing about with the expensive cars and you know what have you. Yeah. Some of us have been working. So this week for me has been planes, trains, and automobiles. Really, it's oh. uh, been a a very extended tour of the Emerald Isles. So I was in Belfast and Dublin and Dundalk and. Everywhere in between, really, from uh, Monday through to last night, and uh, very good it was too. And when the, I tell you what, when the weather is nice in Ireland, it's one of oh, the best yeah. places to be. It is. Uh, but when it's a bit miserable, yeah. as it was yesterday uh, or day before yesterday in Belfast, it was a bit grim, I have to say. But uh, <laughs> it's a great place, and uh, I tell you what, I yeah. just no, love going no, there. No, no offence, Owen. Me. Yeah. <laughs> No, but it's 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 a great place to be, and uh, yeah. everybody's so friendly, and they speak to you in lifts. This is not something that happens in London, as right? You know. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, but I I, I think so, yeah. Uh, so, so, but, Anybody who's been lucky enough to sort of spend more than five minutes with someone who is from, you know, Ireland. I mean, it's, it's mm. like literally. You, I mean, they they'll t- they'll literally talk to anyone. You know, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So I really enjoyed it. So. Hello. Nev, we've got a special question from the chat room for you. Oh. Uh, Tony S is uh, just asking, asking a technical question. He wonders why the show is in 59.94 frames per second. He feels bad <laughs> for the missing 0.06 Ah, right. right. Well, okay. there is a technical description there. Um, how should we... Well, let me say that the, the main <laughs> frequency of us UK and European chaps is 50 hertz. Um but most of the uh, video systems deal with uh, 60 hertz. But because if you if you shoot and transmit things in 60 hertz, you get a bit of a flicker. So yes. we uh, we drop 
a few frames. Um, yes. Which is uh, only a second, point of a frame. Which is what yeah. Yeah. Why do I have yeah. visions of yeah. frames on the floor smashing and stuff? Like, right, because yeah. you're Yeah, evil. that can happen. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. You're yeah. Yes, there we are then. Well, as I say, if anybody else has any further technical queries, do feel free to, <laughs> to, <laughs> to uh, them drop on. a message into the chat room. Actually, Matt, uh, where, where can people well, forward there are their questions of, yeah, So if anybody's got any questions, obviously you can go via the website. You can send us an email. That is uh, Uh Whilst we're live, these also work so do feel free to send stuff in uh, email obviously is podcast at plain talking uk.com you can search the social meds as the he over there keeps <laughs> saying <laughs> you can search for plain talking uk uh, and you'll find us on instagram twitter and facebook and of course uh, if you've got your mobile phone to hand then you can send us a whatsapp it is plus four four seven five seven two two four nine one six six so that's plus four four seven five seven two two four nine one six six so as always each week we save the best till last because with us this week as always it's the other awesome co-host of the show it is the legendary armando oh hey carlos i thought we were just moving on to the commercial news that's yeah. the best no, part, no, right? no 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 <laughs> told you save the best till last mm. yes hey i like that thing growing on your face Thanks. The, thanks. I changed. That's I, ch a, I shaved mine. That's so. really appropriate. You sent. Thing. You sent this yeah. to me in an email. Thanks, yeah. Sam. <laughs> right. Okay. Oh. oh, so how are things with you, Armando? How are things in the world of uh, of Charlotte? Uh, good, actually. Did a lot of flying this week. I think I've flown close to twenty twenty something hours this week. Just a mix of skydive flying, which is always fun, chucking people out of airplanes, and uh, flying to. Basically, I've flown a Cessna, a Cessna 182 all week long. Uh, and then uh, one of the coolest things I did this week was do an airport tour, just kind of as a favor to the, to the city of Concord folks there at the FBO. They said, hey, can you, can you help us organize a tour for some homeschooled kids, ages sort of 5 to 12? And the, some of the tenants there at the Concord, North Carolina airport, which is just north of Charlotte, they're super gracious and they open up their doors. We got a chance to see the, the medical helicopter, one of the race teams uh, who happens to fly a CRJ 700, uh, the fire station and some of the other tenants and the kids, you know, it's just the coolest thing to watch kids when they're, when their eyes get so big and they see the airplanes taken off and they get to climb up on a fire truck and climb up on a, helicopter and it it always rejuvenates me to see that that kind of joy you know in, in kids and it was uh, super cool so that was probably the highlight of of my week i love it when they do stuff like that because it is i i think you sort of miss under i don't know almost miss underrepresent perhaps how much of an impact something like that has on on especially the littlies you know i mean it's i remember uh, we took a, a group of uh, primary school children to a fire station on the outskirts of norwich and they literally got to like sort of hold the hoses and you know sort of go nuts with it and like every single one of those kids left there thinking i want literally saying i want to be a firefighter <laughs> you know and even if only like two or three of those people really follow it through to the i mean that's just such a i think as you say so like you're saying there i mean the the inspiration is fantastic isn't it for for, for doing stuff like that yeah super cool super cool yeah it's always one of those things whenever you go to the air shows and stuff the uh, the, the, the youngsters especially even like the mm. toddlers you know, absolutely love, love, I mean, especially my grand mm. nephews that I have. I, I'm massively instilling the whole aviation thing into them. So much so that I brought loads of, you know, those little, little foam planes that you buy mm. and you put them together and you, they've got the little propeller on the front and you throw, you know, the, the foam, what they call them, the little glider things. Yeah, every time I go around there, I take a pack of 10. Oh, right, because, as you do. Yeah, because normally eight of them get destroyed within the first five minutes. And, <laughs> right, and, yeah. okay, as you do. As you do. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. So a big welcome to everyone who's joined us in the live YouTube chat room this evening. Uh, all the uh, usual family members, plus some extras in there as well this week, some new, uh, yeah. new faces. Um, so we've got Owen in the chat room. Hello to you, Owen. Hope you're well. Uh, Jam, uh, Jamin, Jamimations, hello to you. Uh, we've got Chris Griggs, John Jester, uh, Rick Bell. Hello to you, Rick. He's popping in and out. He's very busy this evening. Uh, Tony S., hello to you. Stephen Hitchin, uh, Lane Street. 
Uh, Neil Lamwarn has got some sad news. Unfortunately, Neil's just got his shift changed through, which means that he probably won't be watching another live PTUK what? show. Oh, oh no. Uh, well, you can always download it, yeah. It's probably the best way to watch it or listen to the show, really, I suppose. Right. It's yeah. Yeah. essentially where we edit out all the, the rubbish. The heavily edited yeah. version, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Stephen Hitchin. Uh, who else have we got? Uh, Auntie Liz. Hello to you, Auntie Liz. And, uh, yeah, greetings to everyone. We've got a couple of new faces in there, actually, I think, as we well, have. isn't there? Yeah, we. Well, yeah, I did. I think I did go through. Did you mention? Oh, I right, did. Okay, mention, yeah. And Javed Rahman. That's it. That, yeah. Hello to you, Javed. Hope you are well. So thanks to everyone who's joined us uh, on this Friday evening. Uh, it is uh, the twenty fifth of October. Yeah. Uh, just coming up to eleven minutes past seven in the evening here in a blustery and wet, uh, windy East Anglia, where me and Matt are currently. But uh, we've got lots to get through on the show this week, all the usual news stories to go through uh, on the show this week. We've got uh, lots of uh, great uh, little news stories coming up. Uh, We've also got the military segment from Armando this week, and we've also got uh, a little bit of news which is coming up at the... uh, the tail end of the show, uh, which Matt has got to uh, well tell you all about. Some very yes. exciting news, mm. for especially for our listeners. So uh, make sure you stay tuned to the end of the show. I'm, I'm panicking now. What, what, what is that? <laughs> oh, God. Okay. okay. Anyway. Uh, uh, sorry, we're, we're getting some WhatsApp messages coming in. Please oh. do fl- feel free to send them, as I say, plus four four seven five seven two two four nine one six six. So do keep this That's coming such in. such a good number. Yeah, it, it's not. But, but uh, it's got 757 <laughs> in it. I know, it's such a good it. number. <laughs> So uh, we are going to start the show then, as we do each week with our rundown of the weekly news from around the world and the UK. So if you're ready, Armando. Ready to go. Nev. Yes, 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 Matt. yes. He's confusing everyone by doing it in a different order, isn't he, this <laughs> week? Yeah. Absolutely, yes. We're all ready. Hit Let's it. go. <laughs> Soaking off this week's first news story, and I thought we'd uh, start this week with some good news for Boeing, because obviously they don't tend to get much, well, good news these days. And uh, this one is on the AirlineRatings.com website. Boeing 777X gets its engines back for the first flight. Woo-hoo. Always handy to have your engines for your first flight. <laughs> Just makes it for interesting. Helps, yeah. Yes. Uh, so the uh, Boeing 777X, uh, one of the aircraft, I can't wait to see this one uh, when it finally gets into service. It's getting its engines back for its first flight, according to a report from Guy Norris of Aviation Week. Uh, the, uh, they reported that the uh, first flight compliant GE9X engine has been delivered by General Electric to Boeing, marking the restart of preparations for the start of the 777 9 flight tests. Uh, the engine is believed to have arrived on the uh, 18th of October and uh, it incorporates improvements to fix durability problems that were unearthed late in a test program earlier this summer. Uh, Norris says the issues centred on the stator veins in the compressor and forced Boeing to delay the start of the flight tests of the 777-9 from July 2019 to early 2020. The report adds the second compliant engine is expected to arrive at Everett by the end of this month, uh, October, according to uh, sources in close to the program. It's expected that the first two engines will be installed on the first test aircraft, Whiskey Hotel 001, and that the 777X will be powered up in in mid-November. However, sources at Boeing tell AirlineRatings.com that the first flight will be uh, still be in January uh, next year, 2020, and Boeing has delayed deliveries, according to this uh, story, until uh, early 2021 of the 777X. But uh, I'm looking, I am really looking forward to seeing this uh, aircraft um, fly for the first time with these engines on. The uh, the pictures that with the follow that go with this story. Uh, show the aircraft in the hangar, um, and it. Uh, I have to say, in that Boeing paint job, I do love that Boeing paint job that they have on their uh, test aircraft. It looks really good. But uh, what do you think, Armando? A game changer for Boeing? Get them back in the good books, possibly. Yeah, it's a game changer for Boeing as well as the rest of the commercial in- industry. The GE nine X. I have a friend that works for GE, and it, it's not all. I think it's the the biggest aircraft engine ever produced it's the quietest aircraft engine ever produced and it's the most fuelish efficient aircraft engine ever produced and i think they did all of that with just innovative manufacturing i was reading that 
some of the parts are 3D printed so that, you know, that's sort of a first in a certified, it may not be a first, but it's significant to mass produce an engine like that, you know, with, with additive, uh, what do they call it? Additive manufacturing uh, techniques. So it's going to be pretty cool to see this airplane, like you're saying, in the air finally. And, mm. and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see. Nev, do you reckon uh, BA will snap some of these or order some of these uh, when uh, these mm, come online? Possibly. I mean, they've been a big 777 um, customer in the past, haven't they? And they've mm. got a lot in their fleet at the moment, and although they're going down the A50 route uh, as well, I, I think this, this, this could be a good aircraft for them, definitely. So uh, let's hope so. Yeah. So moving on to the next story uh, for you, Matt, and this one uh, obviously, as always, is a Ryanair story. Right. But uh, this is this is a, a, a good one, a kind of uh, general story. Right. Okay. So this is on the uh, Irish Times, and the headline is so it's IrishTimes.com, and the headline is Ryanair hires a company in Jordan to carry out aircraft maintenance. Uh, so, jo- Jeramco, uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, Jeramco uh, says it has signed a maintenance agreement for the first time with the Irish airline. So Ryanair has hired Jordan-based Jeramco to carry out detailed maintenance checks on aircraft. Safety regulators require all airlines to carry out regular detailed maintenance checks on their aircraft. Ryanair recently hired Jeramco, uh, based in the Middle Eastern country, uh, country's capital of Amman, uh, to carry out... Um, heavy maintenance checks on its Boeing 737 new generation uh, NG aircraft. The Irish carrier does much of its own maintenance and has several facilities for for this at various locations around Europe, including one at Glasgow in Scotland. Ryanair said that its extensive maintenance schedule meant that it had to contract out some of the work to businesses such as Jeramco. In addition, we will also extend our own capacity with the recently announced expansion of our Seville facilities with an additional three-bay hangar. Uh, Jeramco confirmed in a statement that it had signed a maintenance agreement for the first time with Ryanair. The Irish, the Irish carrier has booked two lines at the Jordanian company's uh, facilities from next month through to March 2020, where the Boeing aircraft will be checked. Heavy maintenance is the most comprehensive of the checks to which aircraft are subject. It involves taking much of an individual craft apart for inspection and overhaul. Estimates of the cost run into one million dollars. That's 900,000 euros per craft for models such as the Boeing 737. Jeff Wilkinson, Jeramco's chief executive, said uh, that the company was delighted to mark the beginning of a new partnership with Ryanair. We look forward to a long-term relationship. Uh, Carsten Mullenfield, uh, Ryanair's uh, Director of Engineering noted that the airline had one of the youngest fleets in the world and a leading safety record. Jeramco, short for Jordanian Aircraft Maintenance Limited, is part of Gulf-based Dubai Aerospace Enterprises, whose finance division has an operation in Dublin. One of the maintenance company's other clients is Irish headquartered aircraft leasing giant uh, Aircap. Is it Aircap? Mm. Um, so yes, yeah, an interesting story there. It's, uh, I think most people associate when you get to see aircraft maintenance with getting it done in the country that the aircraft are based in. Yeah. So I mean, most of Ryanair's aircraft fly out of the UK, so you'd assume that they'd get all their maintenance, heavy maintenance, done within the UK. Hmm. But it obviously must be really cost-effective for them to um, get their maintenance done here uh, in Amman um, with this company. Um, bearing in mind, yeah, you know, you've got to fly the aircraft there. That's fuel, yeah. or be empty aircraft, so it's going to be more fuel efficient. But you know, you've still got that cost involved, so they must have one hell of a deal, I would say, on price per aircraft to get um, these done. What do you think, Armando? Yeah, it it uh, exactly what you're talking about. I remember being up in upstate New York at the old Griffiths Air Force Base, which is now just a commercial air park, and uh, we had airliners from all over the world that would fly in there. And there was a rush, I think they're out of business now, but it was called a Transarum, a Russian company. Mm, yeah. But they had 767s and the best place for them to fly them to and get maintenance at a good price with a company that was well known and, and sort of considered an expert was in Utica, New York. <laughs> so they would fly their airplanes and, and we, I would see aircraft there from all over the world. So I'm sure they, 
you know, that million dollar per aircraft is probably just a drop in the bucket compared to having the, the same thing done in the UK or, or maybe somewhere in Europe. Yeah, is it right? I think BA do most of their maintenance here in the UK, Nev. They've also got uh, bases all around the world, actually. They will fly their aircraft many, many thousands of miles uh, to, to other places like Singapore and um, Malaysia, I think. They've also oh, wow. got a big maintenance base at do Cardiff, but uh, yeah, all, all over the place. Do, do you think that is literally because it is, uh, and I'm sorry to say this is probably the, the dreaded labour question here, but do you think it's perhaps because it is genuinely cheaper, you know, like the cost involved in fuel and everything far outweighs the cost, if you like, when they get there at these remote bases, if you like, to, to have such extensive maintenance done it it could well be and i and i think that's that's the issue really isn't it is, yeah. the, is the labor costs are uh, different in different parts of the world so ba and other airlines take a sort of strategic view mm. on uh, mm. on the best way of doing it so yeah. Uh, yeah very much so sticking with ba nev the next story i i love this one this is great news for um young people in the uk it is and because it's just down the road from me as well, which makes it even more uh, pleasing. <laughs> um, it's, this is on the mirror.co.uk website, and it says that BA will fund flying lessons for 200 students across the UK in 2020 in this inspiring new scheme. Uh, the airline will pay for the private lessons for kids who can get a taste of what life in the pilot seat could be like, as well as the opportunities that could be within their reach. Manpreet Digpool, who's 14 years old, had a private flying lesson and said of the experience, it made me feel really privileged to experience this at such a young age. I'm just overwhelmed by the opportunity. Yesterday I was at school and now I'm flying. I want to be a pilot when I'm older and this is helping me to achieve my dreams. Uh, BA already, already ran a trial uh, of the program earlier this year in partnership with the Air League Trust where it funded lessons for students at the Booker Aviation Flying School in High Wycombe, which is, uh, as I say, just, just down the road from me here. Uh, the success has now seen the airline committing to fund the further 200 flying lessons. Uh, the scheme opened earlier this year and BA says it has thousands of applicants, although it chose the final 200 based on their passion and enthusiasm for flying. Uh, Angela Williams, who's British Airways Director of People, said we know the importance of introducing young people, especially young women, to aviation at an early age in order to inspire them to pursue a career in the cockpit. And that's why I'm thrilled that we're extending this groundbreaking flying initiative to youngsters up and down the UK in 2020. We're passionate about improving diversity across all the areas of our airline and we're committed to investing in the next generation who will join us in connecting Britain with the world and the world with Britain. Uh, the scheme comes amidst the, amidst, 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 I can't even say it. Amidst. Uh, amidst <laughs> yes, that's right. Yes, the airline's expansion to include more experience placements and career opportunities for young people. In fact, 2020, uh, it will become the first and only UK airline to offer a paid summer internship. Uh, you can find out more about the various schemes and work uh, placements and internships on the British Airways career website. Well, that's a nice change, isn't it? Someone's taking some initiative because there's going to be a pilot shortage if there wasn't already. So catching people whilst they're young um, and, you know, years before they can drive a car, for example, is is great. I think that's, mm. a, that's a really good thing. And it's all about the passion and enthusiasm, isn't it? Why don't we have this sort of thing when we were at school, Matt? You know, <laughs> mm. airlines offering yeah. this kind of, um, you know, access for, for young people, I think is a really good idea. So hats off to BA. Really well done. Yeah, agreed. I, it's, it's, I think it's, this is a uh, uh, something for the U.S. airlines to emulate, right? So we have the EAA Young Eagles program here in the U.S., which doesn't have an age limit. Well, maybe have like eight-year-old, you know, get them exposed. And we have the Civil Air Patrol. But what a huge difference it would make in both of those programs if you had an airline such as BA, you know, a major airline that would sponsor uh, youth being exposed to aviation so mm. I, good job to BA and I, I hope that somebody here in the US follows suit and, and does the same thing I'm going to start sending emails to all of them right now sending <laughs> just that story I'll just send that story to send the, yeah, American yeah, Airlines yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. So sticking with uh, you stateside, Armando, uh, the next story for you. Yeah, this is from uh, CNBC.com and uh, U.S. budget carrier Spirit Airlines has agreed on a provisional deal to buy 100 Airbus single aisle jet planes. So more good news for Airbus, isn't it, today? Uh, Spirit Airlines said late Wednesday that it had signed a memorandum of understanding, uh, understanding with the European plane maker that includes a mix of A319neo, A320neo, and A321neo models. At 2018 list prices, the deal would be worth somewhere in the vicinity of 12 billion U.S. dollars in sales to Airbus. But the airline has almost certainly negotiated a steep discount. So the jets are planned for delivery through the end of 2027. A separate option to purchase up to 50 additional aircraft was also agreed upon. Spirit Airlines is based in South Florida. It is an ultra low cost carrier that serves the Americas currently operating in all Airbus fleet. This order represents another milestone for Spirit Airlines, said President and CEO Ted Christie. The additional aircraft will be used to support Spirit's growth as we add new destinations and expand our network across the US, Latin America, and the Caribbean. The deal also marks a notable win for Airbus given that Washington is to impose tariffs on some Airbus airplanes sold into the United States. It is unknown if Spirit managed to negotiate any tariff related discounts, but it may be irrelevant as Airbus does build the A320 planes in Alabama. Uh, Spirit's stock has fallen around 35% this year, primarily due to guidance in July, uh, suggesting earnings per share in 2019 would be roughly flat, but then uh, it jumped again 5% after the Airbus announcement. But they can still afford to buy all these new Airbus aircraft. Yeah, Spirit is, I think, by by all accounts doing well and you know, maybe a, a 35% uh, hit in their stock doesn't affect them that much. I don't know, I, I would, I, I feel like that, that would be a lot of money, but yeah, if they just signed for a $12 billion dollar deal then then they must be sitting all right i was just looking at their current fleet they've obviously got the all airbus fleet 319s 320s 320 neos and 321s but the historic fleet i didn't realize this but historically spirit owned an all mcdonnell douglas fleet dc9s uh, md81s 82s and 83s and 87s which they retired uh, all back in 2006 didn't realize that so yeah interesting mm-hmm. Matt. Yeah, well, you got to start. You got to start somewhere, so you might as well start with the Wright brothers. <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely, yeah, too right. Don't Jeff's listening. <laughs> Indeed, we, we've got some. Uh, we've got some messages. Uh, we've had a message from Andrew Hall on the old WhatsApp here. He sent us a very nice looking little video. Actually, uh, this is apparently a fly past this morning at Norwich Airport. So, he's a local listener. This is very exciting. Very local. Here we go. How good is that? Norwich. I know. I know. Is, is, uh, Armando, obviously you were able we to... We have identify. aircraft in Norwich. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's slightly funny. You, I assume you were able to identify immediately what that, that those aircraft were just by the yeah, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure those are your new F-35s from RAF Marum. Oh! <laughs> See, this is why yeah. we like it. They don't. They wouldn't dare. The third <laughs> funny thing of it is, they probably wouldn't dare land at Norwich Airport because the landing fees are like right. astronomical. Yeah, I don't know what the landing fee is for an F thirty five. Right. Okay. Yes. Uh, frightening. Uh, excellent. I think it's. I, I think it's unless it's gone up. It's around about. I think it's twenty five or thirty quid for a, a right. Cessna one fifty. Okay. Well, I'm sure. I'm not being funny. If you've just had an F thirty five that wants to come into <laughs> land, I'm pretty sure that I don't think even Norwich City Council would be brave enough to charge them. <laughs> Well, can you imagine them just landing there and, you know, somebody going out there in a, in a little yellow pickup truck and saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. hey, but, like, did, but did you call first? Did you get a PPR before landing? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is it. I think not. I've got to be honest. Anyway, thank you, Andrew. Do, uh, do keep the messages coming in. As I say, it is plus four four seven five seven two two four nine one six six is our WhatsApp number. And if anyone has any videos at all from Norwich Airport of commercial airliners flying from there, that would be great. Really? Are there some? Yeah. Possibly. It's only Stuart, isn't it? I know, it's only Stuart. Yeah, it's only Stuart. <laughs> anyway, yes. oh, anyway um, the next story is uh, on Flight Global. I uh, love this website, as does uh, Mr. Bounds. Yes. Uh, uh, Mr. Bounds, what is it that you love so much about Flight Global? Oh. Well, 
It's just so easy to read the story. <laughs> <laughs> Firstly, and also the font is nice, and somebody's actually bothered to proofread it oh, as well. How quaint! Oh. You mean like the grammar's correct and everything? Mm. Yes. And the one thing how you can that concept? one thing you can be sure of with with the uh, flight global is that the aircraft picture shown will marry oh, up with story. the story oh, well. uh, that, that they're yeah. talking about. We hope. Anyway. So uh, this story on flightglobal.com, uh, dot com, and uh, we we've, we've, we've actually covered covered this uh, particular kind of story um it must be a few years ago now okay. but uh the headline on here is uk finally lifts uh, flight bans to sharm el sheikh uh, uk authorities have lifted a flight ban uh, pertaining to services uh, to the egyptian resort of sharm el sheikh four years after imposing the restriction uh, the ban followed a security concern after a Russian operated A321 uh, crashed in Sinai in October 2015. Why is it that long ago? Uh, a loss which Russian authorities believe was a result of sabotage. Uh, UK flights to the resort have uh, have since been prohibited and the route had been served by carriers including BA, EasyJet as well as leisure operators Monarch in the past as all, and Thomas Cook, uh, both of which have since uh, ceased trading as we all know. Uh, Monarch, in particular, had highlighted the ban as being among the financial pressures on the carrier a few months before its failure. But the UK government has uh, worked with Egyptian authorities to address the situation and is lifting the restrictions uh, from the 22nd of October, which is actually, that was this week, wasn't it? Yeah, that's this week. Uh, improvements in security procedures at the airport and close cooperation between the UK and Egypt aviation security mean the commercial airlines can now be allowed to operate routes to and from the airport, says the UK Air Transport Ministry. Uh, it says the government will work with airlines uh, which have expressed interest in operating services to Sharm El Sheikh. Uh, Transport Secretary Grant Shapp says the lifting of the ban is the first step in restoring flights to the resort. Safety and security of the UK citizens, he adds, remains the government's top priority. The Foreign and Commonwealth Office states that there remains a heightened risk of terrorism against aviation in Egypt and additional security measures are in place for flights departing from Egypt to the UK. Now, I will admit it's not on the top of the list of places that I wish to head to uh, in and around uh, the globe, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure, I mean, before this all started, or for, before this all happened, I know that Sharm El Sheikh was a, a very popular uh, yeah, I mean, I, in fact, it's one of the one of the last places I actually went abroad on holiday to, mm. actually. Uh, and I, I'll be honest with you, I loved every single minute of mm. it. It was, a, it's a lo it's a cracking destination. They had, um, a, I remember they done a report on uh, one of those hideous programs we have in the, in the UK that's normally on at nine o'clock in the evening, and they they looked at the security at the airport back then, uh, and it was not brilliant frightening it okay. was frightening actually yeah, yeah okay. it was very frightening as to, to what was going on right. uh, in that airport but uh, yeah it's good to see that obviously the flights all start uh, going back there so moving on to the next story and uh, a, a nice uh, story again for you Matt but not pertaining to Ryanair and no indeed this is unusual so this is on uh, another website with an excellent font choice uh, it is simpleflying.com and the headline is wow <laughs> Qatar Airways to receive 40 new aircraft in the next year so Qatar Airways is poised to take delivery of 40 new aircraft in 2020 this will be the most aircraft received in a single year by Qatar Airways and according to Qatar's CEO the most received by any airline in a single year the record-breaking delivery numbers come despite uh, Doha based airline posting a string of losses including uh, 639 million US dollars in the last financial year. Uh, a report yesterday in the peninsula Qatar uh, quotes Qatar Airways uh, CEO Ak Akbar al Baker. Uh, Baker. Sorry? Baker. Baker. Sorry. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> responding to a question at a press conference on Tuesday, October the 22nd, uh, Mr. Al Baker uh, said, Up to now, we are getting around uh, on average 35 to 36 airplanes a year. Next year, we are embarked 
to get over 40 aircraft. This will be the highest 12-month aircraft delivery to Qatar Airways. I don't think there is any other airline in the world that is taking 40 aircraft in a year. Qatar Airways has a total of 195 aircraft on order, split fairly evenly between Airbus and Boeing. In 2011, Qatar Airways placed an order for 50 A320neos, which it swapped over for A321neos worth 6.35 billion US dollars in 2017. The initial two aircraft from this order were due for delivery this year, but so far none have entered service. Uh, earlier this year, Qatar um, converted 10 of the A320neos in this order, order to the A321neos uh, LR, which I think is long range, isn't it? Uh, in order to open up new long, long skinny routes and provide additional frequency on some existing routes. Mr. Al Baker's uh, airline was the launch customer for the A350-1000 and has an outstanding order for 33 more. Qatar Airways has been progressively rolling them out uh, rolling them out on both key routes such as Doha to Sydney and some surprisingly obscure secondary routes such as Doha to Adelaide. It's worth noting, actually, um, looking at their um, their purchases and orders and stuff, that actually yeah. uh, Qatar um, are obviously an operator of the A380. Uh, they've got 10 of those in their fleet. But they have uh, on order, they've got um, some 777-9s on order, which they intend, according to their site, intend to replace all of their A380s Do they, starting Jingo? in 2024. Right. Okay. So another airline that will be um, offloading some... Uh, more A380s into Very a second cool. hand market. Yeah. So if there's anyone out there who wishes to start an airline <laughs> that <laughs> right, uh, okay. just uses A380s. I mean, the, the only thing that worries me a little bit in that story is at the top at the top of the story it essentially says that they are massively uh you know, they're running at a massive loss. I mean, are they running at a massive <laughs> loss because they're investing so much in in new aircraft? I mean, cuz it, it seems a bit of a strange choice if they aren't making money at the moment. I don't know. What do you, I think they lease they probably lease quite a few aircraft, I right. imagine. Okay. Um, what do you think, Nev? Mm, yes, you're right. Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> Due to a bit of a, a technical uh, issue that I've been dealing with, but I've now dealt with it. So. Oh, very oh, good. good. Uh, back in, back just in time then, by the sound of it. <laughs> it was. Yes. 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 So, well, the next story is on. Uh, oh, this is great. The, so, sorry, I've I've cut straight across you there, Carlos. I do apologise. No, 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 no. I was just going to say this, no this is great. Flying dot com. <clears throat> And this is a great story for two reasons, one of which will become obvious when I start reading it. Mm. And it says that a misjudgment by a lorry driver in China caused the fuselage oh. of an Airbus A320 to become wedged under a bridge. Oh my. Uh, the quick-thinking driver managed to set it free, but not before videos of the event went viral on social media. And clearly, uh, simpleflying.com have been uh, listening to the Plain Talking UK podcast because uh, there's a picture uh, uh, of this uh, of an aircraft and the caption underneath it says what looks like a china southern a320 got stuck under a bridge so you know they're keeping their options open absolutely and, uh, even though it clearly says in like, the picture like that, it, that it does it does clearly say <laughs> yes. uh, airbus a320 in uh, this uh, rather fascinating little video here look there we go <laughs> Yes. Anyway, uh, commuters must have been wondering what was in their morning coffee uh, as they became uh, <laughs> stuck in a jam behind an Airbus. Uh, a bungling lorry driver apparently misjudged the height of his precious load and tried to pass under a bridge that was just too low. Uh, wedged between the bridge and the bed of the lorry, it seemed that there was nowhere for the A320 to go, at least not without causing significant damage to the plane. Uh, the incident happened on October the 13th in the Dali district, uh, the city of Harbin. It was just six miles from the uh, Harbin Taiping International Airport, which may have been where it was headed. Uh, eyewitnesses report suggest that the driver stopped short uh, of the Jin uh, Bridge, uh, likely in order to assess the clearance available. Uh, whether he, ha he had the wrong information or not uh, is unknown. But as he drove forwards, a sickening scraping sound. Oh. The Airbus <laughs> was well and truly stuck. Uh, the driver could not 
proceed nor reverse to free his cargo. For 20 minutes, he pondered his predicament, all whilst keen smartphone owning onlookers <laughs> filmed oh, yes. and photographed his shame. Ha how helpful. Yes, awesome. of course. I'm yes, sure he was absolutely. Uh, but then he had something of a eureka moment <laughs> and let the air out of his truck's tyres. So thanks to the vehicle having massive bouncy tyres, this was enough to give the Airbus the clearance it needed to get on its way. Of course, he reinflated the tyres once on the other side. Apparently, both the bridge and the fuselage are still under going inspection I for damage i mean i mean Had you know this I'm, been a brand curriculum no, i was gonna say i mean that but foul right i mean it's just like it's, you know just a quick polish on well, the top yeah, you'll exactly. notice what they say? Well, of course, had this been a brand new fuselage on, on the way to Airbus's um, final assembly line in, in, in China, the driver would have had some very awkward questions uh, to answer. However, the fact that the fuselage is livered up and a long way from the assembly line uh, suggests it was actually on its way to be broken up anyway. Right. Uh, although the airline name has been removed, the stripes look very much like China Southern livery. <laughs> uh, whatever airline it came from, it doesn't look like it was destined to be used again. It certainly won't be now. Uh, clearly, that driver needs better route planning software than he is currently using. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. I, I know what you mean. Must have been a Tom Tom. Right. Okay. Mm. <laughs> You're not a fan then? No. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, it does, and then the video map played out there during while you're reading out there, and it's um, yeah, it's, uh, it's it's one of those things. I mean, I'd have been quite happy being stuck in traffic behind that. Oh, come off it! No, you wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, I'd have, no, you wouldn't. I'd have, uh... you'd, you'd have found it amusing for five <laughs> minutes, and then you think, oh, right, come on, you moron, you're an idiot. It's a low bridge. What the hell do you think you're doing? And and even you, the the most obsessed man in the world with they, aviation, they obviously don't have the uh, height things on the bridges like we do here in the UK, Matt. Obviously, well, you've uh, got your they probably the coach, do. You've got your height. Um, I do. Yes, yeah, I have a yeah, plaque like, that yeah. tells me exactly what height it should mm. be. Yes, absolutely. Um, but I feel like Carlos, if he had been stuck behind that, would have come up with some innovative ways to reach up there and take some parts off of the right. yeah, A320 absolutely. and uh, yeah. 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 You know, take him home and say, yeah, we'll cut some clearance off the top. My garden's that way. That right. way. Yeah. I mean, that you way. Know, I mean the, guy is, the guy is always essentially looking for Christmas uh, competition giveaway gifts, aren't you, Carlos? Yeah. That'll, that'll be it. He'll be looking. He'll I've be got a couple at home, some... actually, for this year. Uh, have you? Uh, right. Posted something in the chat room uh, for the folks to see, which is called the 11 foot 8 bridge crash compilation, uh, which oh, uh, lovely. Uh, American people might be uh, <laughs> might familiar enjoy. with. Yes. And uh, it, it, it's a good example of how to fill out a lot of paperwork. Oh, I do like paperwork. It's my favourite thing to do. <laughs> Really? Anyway, uh, no, I'm being sarcastic. Okay. Uh, Armando, dig us out of this little cul-de-sac. This is this is the, the <laughs> next story is, is good news for uh, for all A340 lovers. Ah, yeah, this is uh, in recent months the Portuguese airline TAP Air Portugal has been taking deliveries of new wide-body aircraft, the A330. So the fleet modernization effort has gone hand in hand with the airplane, the, the airlines phasing out of the old A340s. Oh. So now uh, Armando, only... I, I don't wish to alarm you, but uh, uh, podcast royalty just appeared in the chat room, so no pressure. Oh, you know what? <laughs> What's funny is uh, my chat room turned into the definitive 11 foot 8 bridge crash compilation. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Unlucky. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Never so, know. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> whoever's in whoever's in the chat room. Hello. Yeah, hello, yeah, okay. uh, I'll, Oh I'll, gosh. I'll give you I'll give you a clue. He's a currently serving captain. Ah, got it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah could be could be anyone. Uh, yes, no, I'm just right. kidding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh let's see. They only have two A three forties left in their fleets. Oh, and oh. apparently they're not gonna be around very much longer. Who uh, yeah, they're, they're flying their last flights this week. Uh, data gathered from air fleets show that these two aircraft carry uh, registrations. Charlie Sierra, Tango Oscar Bravo, and Tango Oscar Charlie. They're both roughly 24 years old and have served the airline since coming out of the Airbus factory. Hmm. So apparently the last A340-300 routes will be uh, Lisbon... Two, London Heathrow, Luanda, Maputo, 
Recife and Rio de Janeiro. I am somewhere. delighted you have that story. <laughs> <laughs> All between the 22nd and 26th of October. So the phase out was previously scheduled until uh, late December 2019. But, uh, you know, obviously there's been a change and they're doing it a little bit early. So the aircraft have been taken over the new routes since... Uh, the, oh, sorry, the A330 has taken over the A340 routes, um, as well as SAS, other airlines. So it's what Scandinavian Air Service. They're also retiring their A340s. So, um, yeah, the story kind of goes on to explain, you know, why the, the A330 Neo is so good and so much better. But, yes, another A340 operator, you know, getting rid of them. It's a shame. It's a shame. Um, no, it really is. Obviously, for Captain Nick because he loves these aircraft. Right. Isn't he? <laughs> You're right. Okay. You know, I, I, I keep thinking, just like you were talking about the A380, uh, these airplanes would make great military transports. I don't, I don't know yeah. why some air force somewhere doesn't pick these up. That's true, actually. Yeah, yeah. The three. I mean, these are the Dash 300. Um, these 340s, but um, I think uh, Nick used to fly the Dash 600. Um, which is obviously a lot, lot, looks a lot better, I think, the Dash 600 and the 300. So, but yeah, you're true though, Armando. These would make, um, these would make really good uh, transports. But then I suppose, with our, with well, especially with our uh, government mm. trying to pinch every penny. Well, that that um, is true. Four engines is way too many. Yeah, for, well, uh, there, there is that to it. Car. Yes, absolutely. Mm. Uh, it's it's uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a sort of a funny uh, funny situation, really. I guess I don't I don't know how it works over in Europe. Here in the U.S., we have this. Uh, oh gosh, uh, Rick Bell can probably help me out in the chat room. But it's uh, it's like craft or something like civil. It's basically the civilian reserve air fleet or something like that, and it's a way for private operators to get military contracts. So I know Omni, uh, World, ATA. Uh, there's there's a few big carriers that sort of lease or you know contract their services to the military, and maybe somebody like Highfly, you know, could yeah. do the same thing where they could. They see, these aircraft up. Yeah. They, they see. Uh, so they seem to be favouring the A three eighty, don't they? At the moment, uh, you know, perhaps not so much the the A three forty. As I say, because I think mo I think most of theirs are A three eighties, aren't they? With my mm. fly. Yeah. It's, so um, our podcast royalty that uh, Civil Reserve Air Fleet. Um, so uh, Captain Jeff in the chat room, and uh, and John Jester too just reminded me that it, it's not just you know, sort of these smaller operators, but uh, legacy car carriers, Atlas, Delta, United, American, FedEx, uh, all have contracts. And that these guys are, are jogging my memory. It, it, in the event of a large scale deployment, like we saw in the in the first Gulf War, you you can call upon these airlines and they'll, um, oh, you know, see. they'll carry the troop. You know, I, I, I hate I hate to plug other podcasts, but our friends over at APG, Captain Nick, this would be a, actually a great uh, plain tales. Oh, it would, wouldn't I'm it? I'm going to suggest that yeah. the civil the civil reserve. Oh, do that, absolutely. That'd be a great plain tales. Yeah, absolutely. There we go. It you would. Um, uh, but going back to the Norwich uh, Airport thing, you know, and the fact that nobody ever flies oh, really uh, out of there. Um, Who's flown before? There? Well, no, I, 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 uh, Nev uh, sent us a, a video actually, which which I, I've I've loaded up, uh, which is of a KLM uh, something or other about to take off there, which is fine. What the one thing that Nev sort of I don't know whether Nev missed it or whether he was being ironic, but uh, this unfortunately is footage back from 2014. So uh, all oh, all I can do at the moment is oh. confirm that a KLM plane took off at Norwich Airport in 2014. In 2014. <laughs> yes, and that was a uh, Fokker 70, by the way. Thank you things. very um, much, yes. But, uh, yes, that there, that there was some irony. Uh, yes, indeed, that. yes. So we can confirm that something took off in 2014. There we are. Uh, Isn't it amazing to look how the engine's nearly as big as the actual aircraft right. itself? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. There we go. Anyway, thank you for that. Uh, if you want to uh, uh, send in your WhatsApps, please do so, and we can include them in our live show this evening. It is plus four four seven five seven two two four nine one six six. That's plus four four seven five seven two two four nine one six six. Need a jingle. 
We need a jingle. Right, for that. okay. Anybody want to make us a jingle? Please can feel someone free. Make, <laughs> can someone make, can someone make us a jingle, please, right. for our WhatsApp number? Okay, Thank you. lovely. Yeah, good luck. So moving on to the next story. <laughs> this one is again on the Awesome Flight Global website. And uh, uh, this story was uh, actually on the Aviation Herald as well this week, but it's quite, that was quite a big story when it uh, broke. This was uh, Thai uh, 777 engine failure spurs engine um, emergency engine checks. Uh, operators of, uh, of certain Boeing 777-300 ERs are being ordered uh, to conduct engine checks after the uncontained engine failure of a General Electric GE-90 power plant on a Thai Airways International aircraft. Now, the failure involved uh, Thai's flight uh, TG-970 as it commenced its takeoff roll uh, for Zurich on October the 20th. Uh, U.S. FAA regulators have issued emergency airworthiness directives, uh, which, uh, while not specifying or spe- specifically mentioning Thai, refers to an uncontained GE-90-115B high-pressure turbine failure on the same date. And it says on the report that uh, the takeoff was aborted as a result, and the debris struck the aircraft fuselage and its other engine as well. Uh, the derivative requires removal, uh, or directive, I should say, requires removal uh, within 25 cycles of rotating uh, interstage seal components from the engines with eight particular serial numbers. Uh, well, for those of you watching in YouTube world, you'll see that Matt's popped the picture up there of said engine failure, which looks rather messy. Messy. is the best way um, to describe that. It states that uh, the measure is designed to prevent high-pressure turbine failures, which could lead to release of damaging high-energy debris. Uh, GE Aviation says the directive is exhibiting a, an abundance of caution and recommends the depairing affected engines within 10 cycles. It adds that uh, it's mobilized technical resources, tooling and spare engines as required in order to minimize customer disruption during engine removals. Over 2,000 of the power plants are in service. Uh, The company points out it states that Uh, It's supporting the investigation authorities, including the U.S. National Transportation Safety Board, as the inquiry progresses. Um, There's quite a full sort of report on this on uh, on the Aviation Herald website, uh, which makes for good reading. But, uh, yeah, it's safe to say that uh, it's never good when this happens, especially when there is high... Uh, flying pieces of debris. Indeed, actually, and John, John Jester just said in the chat room here, he's saying that uh, that looks like an entire disc came out. Mm, it's yeah. quite, uh, yeah, because we all know what happens when uh, engines like this or uncontained engine failures happen um, on large uh, aircraft, such as, uh, mm. say, let's say, for instance, Qantas A380s, uh, yeah, well, yeah. when this happened um, mm. on the, I forget which flight number it was now, uh, when they, they had that problem there and pieces of shrapnel took out various hydraulics and uh, other wow. parts uh, of the aircraft so yeah not not ideal what do you think uh, armando yeah i couldn't couldn't agree with you guys more i, I think that's uh, not ideal could be problematic <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely yeah. so matt i've got an awesome story for you next because yeah. uh, this one is regarding uh, one of uh, one of one of these up and coming airlines that seems to be going from strength to strength here in the UK. Up and coming? I, I, I think well, they've been about a while. I can say, yeah. So, anyway, Chronicle Live is the website. Are you drunk while reading this story? Uh, um, no, no, but I, I can okay. be. I'm not working tomorrow <laughs> if you'd like me to consume something stronger. Uh, <laughs> Normally, when we cover these stories about yeah. Jet 2, that's because of drunk passengers. Yeah, I'm, I'm jealous of our one there. You see, he's, he, he's on it. Well, I assume that's T, obviously, in there, is it? Yeah. Earl Grey. Yeah, right, okay, he's got his thumbs up. Excellent, good. Uh, that works really well on an audio podcast. Thanks for that, Armando. Much appreciated. <laughs> and uh, anyway, Chronicle Live is the <laughs> website. And the headline is Jet to announce Newcastle to New York. Uh, to return for winter 2020. So the mm. four night trips include Thanksgiving, Christmas shopping and winter in New York, departing on the 22nd of November, 26th of November, 3rd of December and 17th of December 2020. This is exciting. So Geordie holidaymakers are being given the chance to take a bite of the Big Apple after putting four New York trips on sale from Newcastle Airport. Uh, following another year of exceptional demand with sellout uh, New York holidays, Jet 2 and Jet 2 City Breaks has added more trips of a lifetime for winter 2020 with flights direct from Newcastle International Airport. And they went on sale today. Uh, These four-night trips include Thanksgiving... Hang on, we've just gone through that. Uh, 
anyway, in total, the company is putting on 19 New York trips from six of its UK bases for winter 2020, as well as award-winning flights with Jet2. There are package breaks for sale with Jet2 City Breaks across the iconic three- to five-star hotels in central New York locations. Steve Heapy, who is the chief executive of uh, Jet2 and Jet2 City Breaks, said that our New York trips from New, New, uh, Newcastle Airport have once again proved extremely popular with customers uh, looking to enjoy a break to the Big Apple ahead of Christmas. And we're delighted to be offering another program of direct flights and unforgettable trips to the magical city of... Uh, fro- <laughs> I nearly said the magical city of Newcastle. Uh, but from Newcastle Airport <laughs> with Thanksgiving, Christmas uh, shopping and winter in the New York uh, in New York covered. There really is something for everyone. Packages with Jet 2 City Breaks from Newcastle start from 899 pounds per person and they can be secured now for only 60 pounds per person deposit jet to uh, flight only options are also available from 419 pounds per person including taxes now i uh done a little bit of delving uh Did you? online right. okay and uh, yeah i uh, looked at uh, booking a flight with uh, jet to uh, f- to new york uh, for uh, me and uh p- Matt uh, hi. Uh, to go to New York and uh, right. <laughs> me and Matt okay. are going to take uh, a, a trip to New York uh, for a week uh, with two uh, suitcases uh, both weighing 22 kilos each Right. and uh, for our return flights Matt you'll be pleased to know it will cost me and you a grand total of £852 Lovely. to that go sounds... to New York for the week uh, does that sound good for you? Uh, it's... Yeah, it's absolutely. Not, it's not a bad price. How, how does I mean? To, obviously, Armando, um, that's in pounds. How does that sound to you, kind of uh, price-wise, to fly from uh, the UK to New York? I think that's probably about average. I I know uh, what when, when from from New York to London is you know right around four hundred pounds, five hundred pounds. So I guess you know to the convenience that's. Would anybody say the convenience of going to Newcastle? Uh, yeah, a bit, a bit I, of I a drive that, for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. It seems a little high for me, but but um, you know, perhaps know. perhaps any of our listeners who uh, who live in Newcastle could uh, contact us and, and let us know whether that's a a good price to pay. Nev, uh, are you going to be jumping on this uh, trip to New York with Jet Two? Well, it's not not bad, is it? Let's be honest. That's a that's a pretty good. Um, Pretty good fare, uh, but obviously, geographically speaking, Newcastle isn't just down the road for me. No, no. no, no, no. <laughs> it's, it's but actually, on the serious though, it, for, for people that uh, live in the northeast of England, that's going to work, isn't it? It's really good. Yeah. So, moving on to the next story, Nev, special story uh, next for you, isn't it? Yeah, this has been, uh, I won't say it's breaking news, but the, there's some information that's uh, come to light today. Uh, it's on the BBC website about the uh, Boeing 737 MAX uh, Lion Air crash Um, and uh, the report is now out um, and it says that a series of failures led to the crash of this flight which killed 189 people and led to the grounding of the 737 MAX. Uh, Investigators said faults by Boeing, Lion Air and the pilots caused the crash five months after the disaster in October last year, an Ethiopian Airlines plane crashed, killing all 157 people on board, which led to the grounding of the entire 737 MAX fleet. Uh, Faults with the plane's design have been linked to both crashes. On Friday, uh, air crash investigators in Indonesia released their final report detailing the list of events that caused the Lion Air jet to plunge into the Java Sea. Uh, From what we know, there are nine things that contributed to this accident, uh, they said. Uh, And if one of the nine hadn't have occurred, maybe the accident wouldn't have happened. So what does the report say? Well, the 353-page report found that the jet should have been grounded before departing on the fatal flight because of an earlier cockpit issue. However, uh, because the issue wasn't recorded properly, the plane was allowed to take off without the fault 
being fixed, it said. Furthermore, a crucial sensor, which had been brought, uh, bought from a repair shop in Florida, had not been properly tested, the report found. Uh, and on Friday, the US aviation regulator revoked the company's certification. The sensor fed information to the plane's maneuvering characteristics augmentation system, or MCAS, uh, that software which is designed to help prevent the 737 MAX from stalling, had been a focus for investigators uh, trying to find the cause of both the Lion Air and the Ethiopian Airlines crashes. Uh, Indonesian investigators identified issues with the system, which repeatedly pushed the plane's nose down, leaving pilots fighting for control. Uh, it showed that there were incorrect assumptions about how the MCAS would behave and that the deficiencies had been highlighted during training. Furthermore, the report uh, found that the first officer who had been performing poorly in training struggled to run through a list of procedures that he should have memorised. Uh, he was flying the plane just before it entered into the fatal dive, but the report said that the captain had not briefed him properly when he handed over the controls as they struggled to keep the plane in the air. Uh, the report also found that 31 pages were missing from the plane's maintenance log. Uh, Indonesian investigators had previously said that mechanical and design problems were key factors in the crash of the Lion Air plane. Um, uh, there's uh, the uh, the um, BBC um, business correspondent Theo Leggett uh, says that uh, this report describes a catalogue of failures from poor communication to bad design to inadequate flying skills, which culminated in the deaths of 189 people. There are a lot of what-ifs what here. If the crew of the previous day's flight had given a more detailed description of the problems they'd faced, the aircraft might never have taken off on its fatal flight. And if the captain, who successfully kept the plane in the air, uh, despite the intervention of a rogue automated system he didn't understand, hadn't handed over to his less capable first officer, disaster may have been avoided. Uh, as Boeing's chief executive, Dennis Mullenberg, has repeatedly stated, there was a chain of events, but the heart of that chain was MCAS, which is the control system that the pilots didn't really know about, and um, which was vulnerable to a single sensor failure. So Boeing and the regulators allowed the system to be designed in this way and didn't change it after the Lion Air crash, leading to a further disaster. And that means that whilst report clearly points to serious failures by a parts supplier and by the airline itself, it is Boeing that will ultimately wear the greatest share of responsibility. Um, and it's uh, the typical airline accident, isn't it? It's mm. a, a series of events that have occurred and uh, the holes in the Swiss, Swiss cheese have lined up uh, to cause this. Um, so this is a very comprehensive report. Um, there will be more to come. Um, and we've seen reports in the media that Boeing expect to be uh, flying the aircraft again in January of next year. But um, mm. I think that remains to be seen at the moment. I mean, this... The, the... I mean, I don't think we should perhaps go on about this too much, but I mean, I, I do think it's interesting that, I mean, they're not solely putting it on, they're not putting it on pilot error or anything like that, are they? But it is interesting that that their handling of the situation, if you like, has, is being deemed as contributing towards Armando. Sorry, you, you, you want to chime in there? Yeah, no, I, I, I'd like to add add to what you guys are all saying right and and one of the staples of safety investigations is how can this accident be preventable and that has sort of gone on to be taught in crew resource management or cockpit resource management or single pilot resource management that just like you guys are saying mm. an, an accident is rarely caused by a single factor yeah. it is almost almost always there is an error chain that has taken place and if more and more people are educated into those those things to look out for then then that mishap or that accident could have potentially be avoided, prevented yeah. but one of you know one of the things that make that this makes me think about is we focus very much on air crew being trained in crm and risk management and i i know i've taught hundreds of people are, are not taught but facilitated hundreds of of crm sessions and refresher sessions with pilots and air crew you know cabin crew but how much is this emphasized 
in those maintenance and supporting functions. So even even something like the the galleys uh, service, you know, the catering, anybody that's around aircraft, whether it's lab service, catering, engineers, mechanics, manufacturing, you know, I, I think that I would like to think that at the core, people understand that what they do is incredibly important to something as dangerous as aviation, but how much does the company, how much does the company management emphasize on those those kinds of, you know, risk management techniques where, where something like this could be prevented, you know, and, and obviously it's, it's really quirky to use, you know, just a, a regular word that there's 31 pages of aircraft logs missing. missing if, yeah. if I were to buy a Cessna 172 and it was missing 31 pages of logs, then I probably would not buy that aircraft. Yeah. So that's terrible to think that, that for a 737 that's gone missing. I mean, I, I mean, I, sorry, Armando. I mean, I'm having to sort of push this to you, really, because I, I guess you're the only one with a reasonable chance of being able to answer this question. Um, but do do you think do you think like this report in some way might help? I don't know. I don't. Does it change the how Boeing have to deal with this essentially? Because uh, you know, you you could argue that you read this report and it sort of rather indicates that actually, yes, all right, there is this MCAS issue. Obviously, we 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 did, we've spoken about it before. We're aware of it as a as a major problem. Don't get me wrong. But does a report like this maybe sort of? I don't know. I I, I still feel like this report is putting the um, onus more perhaps on on Lion Air and its crew, perhaps, you know, in this report? Yeah, I can't speak for Boeing, obviously, but I I would imagine that Boeing already knew all of this. Right. The, the moment those aircraft crashed, they would have gone through the records, through the manufacturing records, and they have they would have realized exactly where all of the parts came from. They would have investigated we you know all of their manufacturers, everything that could have possibly contributed. And then additionally, I think that folks at Lion Air, you know, it was, it was pretty soon after the crash that we started questioning their training, questioning their, their crew resource management and their, their, you know, flying technique. And, and, you know, we, you start diving into the crew experience and then right away the engineers and mechanics who touched that airplane. So I don't think this is, this comes as a surprise to anyone. I think putting it, you know, amalgamating it all in one report. I don't know if it takes the onus off Boeing, but it certainly distributes the contributing factors across the board a little bit. And, and I'm just curious as to what, you know, is there any accountability with those folks? Boeing has taken a huge yeah, hit, absolutely. you know, yeah. their profits have, have, have yeah. halved in, in the last year. So Boeing has taken the brunt of this, but what happens to that, that equipment manufacturer in Florida? What happens to the, you know, is there accountability across the board or, yeah. you know, I, I guess that's what it makes me uh, wonder. And there, I mean, there's loads of the comments in the chat room here uh, that, the, that are going, I, I won't go through them all, but I will just uh, pick out a couple if I may. So John Jester says 31 uh, pages is a week or two at most of write-ups. Uh, that could go missing just by losing one envelope. Uh, we mail ours to HQ and I could totally see something like that going missing. So that's an interesting take on it. Micah is saying that there are many faults here. The crew is part of it. The accident could have been prevented at any point by correcting any of the single problems. So, you know, I, I, yeah, I, I, it's uh, we st there's still so much information we don't know uh, about this, isn't there, really? And I guess some of these questions we're never going to truly know the answer to, are we? Mm. Yeah, and John is a, a great person to talk to about this you know I, I i may do a sort of a recorded segment with him about yeah. the uh because he is an accident investigator for his airline okay cool and uh he, you know he 
Yeah, it, yeah. it'd be really see, interesting the, to to see the process. This also yeah. is 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 another thing that worries me, perhaps, because you know I, I'm the first to admit I'm a layman here, obviously, but I see detail like that that appears in this report that we've all sat down and read. At some, I mean, I read my I read it at lunchtime today. Um, you know, we we sit down and read these things as I say, and and I, I I saw that bit about the fact that there were pages missing from the log, and I immediately thought. Well, that's clearly a very serious issue. What the hell's going on here? Blah, you know that that kind of thing. But as you said, as as John's quite rightly pointed out, actually, you know, in the grand scheme of things, that's not really a a big thing. But to a layman like me, that seems like a really big issue. It, it, I don't know. Is is it helpful sometimes that this information is being sort of put out into the public domain so early? Well, I, the purpose of putting it all out there is to prevent. The next one right? right so maybe somebody will some operator somewhere will read that as a footnote in the report yeah. and they will go back through their records and say well you know what if we ever have a mishap let's make sure that we don't have anything yeah. missing okay. no, fair point yeah. so yeah. yeah i mean nev is there is there sort of much uh, you you would like to add to this well uh oh well if i if I turn my volume oh, thank up, you. that's yes. going to help. Uh, You're a bit quiet enormously, there, isn't it? <laughs> so talking about incorrect operation of equipment. Yeah, um, right, indeed. But uh, <clears throat> you've got to realise here that this is probably Boeing's biggest moment, apart from when the company almost went bankrupt when they built the 747 back in, mm. uh, in the late 60s, early 70s. This is a massive moment where this is going to be the plane for them in terms of uh, promised fuel savings for the yeah. operators and all the rest of it. And here they are in a situation where uh, even after the FAA have um, given it the green light, uh, EASA uh, in yeah. Europe uh, are saying, well, we're going to take our own opinion on that. And if they don't certify it back into service, then that's a big problem. Um, because obviously some of the 737 Maxes uh, are capable of going from, you know, Toronto or the east coast of the US uh, to London. London and back. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the, uh, uh, this is, I, I would, I'm obviously no expert in this area, but no. it would not surprise me if uh, even more caution uh, is taken with this because they cannot afford to have another moment no. uh, like no. this. So they might take their time and, and they might, it might cost them some more money, clearly. But, I mean, you know, what, what price uh, people's lives and, and the confidence to, to fly in these aircraft? Yeah, and I mean, you know, I'm, you know, I'm the first to admit. I mean, we've spoken about this before, and ironically, once, once it does more or less go back into into service, I mean, I can't help but feel that essentially by travelling on that aircraft, it will be one of the safest aircraft that you could ever possibly travel on because, you know, they just can't have anything go wrong again, can they? Yeah, absolutely. So the last story in uh, the commercial segment this week. Uh, is for you, Armando, and it's about a certain subject that we all love to hate. Yeah, it is uh, undoubtedly our favorite, not so favorite thing to do in the world, and it is go through customs. Hey. Yeah, apparently the longest customs line possible. I don't know about possible, but Orlando International Airport takes the cake. Uh, a new study says MCO which Captain Nick actually was the one that told me that that uh, came from McCoy. It was used to be McCoy Airport or McCoy Air Force Base. Uh, so MCO, Orlando International Airport, has the longest customs wait times of any airport in the U.S. Uh, the report finds out that it is dead last uh, with an average wait time of 25.8 minutes, which granted is not that bad uh, compared to some – European countries that I've been to. Beautiful. So by comparison, our very own Charlotte Douglas International Airport has about the same number of passengers as uh, Orlando at 46 million passengers annually. But we have a wait time of only 13.4 minutes. Uh, McCoy, uh, McCoy uh, Orlando International Airport uh, processes an average of 120 passengers through customs every 15 minutes, one quarter of Chicago O'Hare's International Airport, which manages an average of over 485 passengers in the same 15 minute period. Uh, O'Hare also handles twice as much overall traffic as Orlando. 
let's see some of the other airports on this list. So the best ones, uh, Orlando O'Hare International Airport, uh, Dallas Fort Worth International Airport at 459 per, per 15 minutes, uh, Houston George Bush Intercontinental at 445. And then I'll skip down middle of the pack. You have Washington, Dallas, Miami, Boston, JFK, somewhere around the 300 mark. And just for giggles, the last three are Seattle, Tacoma International Airport at 242 per 15 minutes, Fort Lauderdale at 197, and bottom of the list, Orlando at 120. (laughs) So it's safe to say, if you want to go to travel to the U.S., you need to travel to uh, O'Hare International Airport to, yeah. to wait the least amount of time. Well, according to these numbers, anywhere but Orlando. Yeah, I mean, I had. <laughs> I mean, we had when we flew back into Luton last month. At least, what you, your favourite airport? You uh, at least <laughs> half an hour's wait to get through customs, you know, passport control on the way really? back. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. With just a sheer I, amount I, of passengers. I will say for a foreigner, a non-UK resident or non-EU resident flying into the UK, before I had my uh, known traveler, um, you know, where I got certified with a with the border force, it, those waits are often in the hours at at the border crossing for a non-EU citizen. So once I had my my little chip registered and I had process through a uh, border force uh, i believe it was four times uh, on after the fourth time into the country you could apply to be a, a known traveler and uh i don't i don't think i ever waited more than 10 minutes going through customs at heathrow uh, sometimes the you know um well you know i had the option of going through the non-eu line or the eu slash uk citizen line so i would just pick the shortest one Wherever it was. <laughs> uh, in the chat room, uh, Neil Lamorne has said that apparently Krakow is horrendous, much worse than Luton. Is it? Uh, East, uh, Stephen Hitchin says in the chat room, East Midlands at midnight on Monday night, one plane landed, 30 minutes wait. Wow. Oh. Uh, Owen, uh, uh, the top man is Owen in the uh, chat room, says that uh, Stansted for non-EU is insane at peak times. And uh, Tony S says that even UK residents coming back to the UK, uh, the wait is horrendous. So uh, <laughs> if anyone else has any wonderful stories of how long they've stood <laughs> waiting in a queue to get back into their own country, uh, let us know via uh, via the WhatsApp line or right, by yeah, email. yeah, or by email, yeah, podcast at playtalkinguk.com. dot uh, com. <laughs> actually, there's a lot, lots of things going through now. Uh, Chris Griggs has said that JFK took hours when he went through that. But JFK is a huge. You've been you've been through JFK, haven't you? JFK, you went. No, through no, the way Newark. To I went through Newark. Yeah, Newark. Yeah, yeah. That, was that hideous to get through for? Um, or that was just a sort of. No, it was really easy. Oh, okay. Uh, the, the biggest delay was not getting through customs or anything like that. It was literally queuing to get out of the airport. Oh. Um, <laughs> Stephen Hitchin makes a very good point, actually, Matt, in the chat room, uh, yeah, doesn't on, he? Yeah. Hey, uh, Stephen says that sla- um, slap your noise cancelling headphones on and listen to your well, favourite podcast. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> very, very good, Stephen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, uh, he's we, cl- can start me- we can start measuring the customs lines. If you're able to get through Aviation News Talk, yeah. if you're able to get through <laughs> PTUK yeah. in one line, yeah. or uh, if you get to one or two APGs in one line, then... <laughs> yeah, well, absolutely, yeah. You know, I mean, obviously, I, yes. <laughs> There we go. Uh, <laughs> you know. So up next, we're going to hand things over then uh, for uh, for the next segment part of the show. So we're going to hand things over, as we always do, to uh, to Armando. So Armando, what's uh, what's coming up next? Yeah, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on what side of the fence you're on, we don't have a lot of military stories. It was kind of a quiet week in the gray stuff. But uh, if you guys are ready, we'll uh, we'll knock out just a few military stories. Yeah, that's good. Let's go. Yeah, 
Yeah, so this first story is actually from uh, Jonathan Warner. So uh, chat room and fans and listeners keep the stories coming because you guys find some great ones. So these are Russia's blackjack bombers arrive at Waterkloof Air Base. Somebody can correct me on the uh, pronunciation of that. So Russia landed the world's biggest military aircraft in South Africa on Wednesday, the Tupolev Tu-160 blackjack bomber in a rare display of cooperation between the defense forces of the two countries. Uh, the two bombers, which are capable of n- launching nuclear missiles, are the first ever to land in Africa and were escorted by fighter jets from the South Africa Air Force as they arrived at the Waterkloof Air Base in, I'm not going to pronounce it, T-S-H. W-A-N-E. Uh, the bombers arrived about 4 p.m. and a number of other Russian military aircraft uh, also landed at the site. The bombers had initially been scheduled to land earlier. The military-to-military relations between the two countries are not solely built on struggle politics, but rather on fostering mutually beneficial partnerships based on common interests, said the South African National Defense Force in a statement. Russia's defense ministry put out a similar statement. The arrival of the bombers in Africa's most industrialized nation coincides with the Russian president, uh, Vladimir Putin, hosting an uh, Africa summit this week, the first such event to be organized by Russia. The nation is competing with China and the U.S. for influence in Africa. Uh, So this is... uh, Probably not what you're going to expect me to say, but I'm glad to see this happening, actually. I, uh, I believe that working with any up-and-coming nation or e- even those mid-tier defense forces, uh, can, it can be incredibly beneficial to work with a larger developed armed force, such as the Russians, the Chinese, or the U.S., amongst others. You know, there are some smaller countries that has some fantastic air forces, but I'm actually glad to see that uh, the South African Defense Force is, is uh, out there, you know, and showing cooperation with, with other countries because at the end of the day, believe it or not, we, you know, sometimes we all have to work together. You know, in, in, in the Middle East, we end up, Probably doesn't make it much to the news, but we end up coordinating with the Russians to see where they're going to operate. And we stay out of their airspace. They stay out of our airspace. But by and large, we have the same uh, goal at at the end. And uh, I know I've I've worked in quite a few countries in Africa where I've seen some quirky airplanes from quirky countries that you wouldn't expect. But at the operations level where, you know, you get out of the airplane – I would love to go over and see an AN-72 or an AN-124 or something like that. And, and generally I would just go over there, introduce myself and, and uh, jump on their airplane and, you know, we bring them on our airplanes. Yeah. It was so cool. You know, (laughs) whatever happens in the news and politics and in the capitals of these countries at the operations level, it's pretty neat to work together with another country and uh, and you certainly certainly learn so much it's worth noting actually uh, armando these um tu-160s first flew in december 1981 and they didn't just have one or two prototypes of this aircraft they actually built nine prototypes of the tu-160 um 36 in total of these being built um through its production uh, history uh, but introduced into service in 19, uh, 1987, in April, uh, when these were introduced into service. But it's kind of like a mini Concorde, isn't it, when you look at this actual <laughs> picture of this aircraft. But moving on from uh, one Russian story uh, to another uh, story involving Russia. And uh, this one is on the foxnews.com website. And the headline, Pentagon will send more than 50 F-35s to Europe, oh cheers for that, to uh, deter Russia. So the Pentagon is sending more than 50 F-35 joint strike fighters to Europe over the next few years uh, to deter Russia 
and help NATO prepare for an entirely new kind of warfare. Uh, by the time uh, the aircraft get here, they'll be 100 plus F 35s uh, there with uh, our European partners. Air Force General James Holmes told reporters at a recent Air Force Association conference at Maryland's Na uh, National Harbor. Uh, he said that we'll be uh, falling in on our European partners who already have their F 35s. Uh, although the, nuff, the uh, full number of just over 50 combat aircraft won't arrive until early the 2020s, uh, preparations have already uh, got underway. Uh, the Air Force didn't specify where, where the F-35s will be sent, citing security reasons. However, there are numerous vital strategic areas in the region, such as the Baltics and places in Eastern Europe, that might be considered. Emphasizing the arrival of the fighters will uh, train and operate together with European allies, Holmes said the move was important uh, to our ability to compete and deter in Europe. Bringing F-35s to the uh, European continent introduces a range of new attack options for US and NATO forces seeking to prevent potential Russian, uh, Russian advances. Uh, it brings uh, fifth generation stealth which includes targeting sensors with never before seen range and new air to air weapons and drone like ability to surveil and target areas of interest. US and allied F 35s uh, all have a common data link which enables uh, uh, disperse yet networked attack options. In a tactical sense, it seems that high speed F 35 fortified by long range sensors and targeting technologies might well be positioned to identify and destroy mobile weapons launchers or other vital but slightly smaller ones on the move targets. Once the F-35s get there you will uh, see it mo uh, be moved around and used. It will operate with our allies, uh, reassure them and do some deterrence as well. Uh, Colonel William Marshall, 48th Fighter Wing Commander, told reporters at the AFA. The arriving F-35s will work through the US Air Force and Europe and um, it's safe to say that um, these are becoming uh, quite uh, a sight now. Obviously, we had um, some of these in the pictures earlier on uh, in the UK. I've been lucky to see these flying over where I work as well um, here in the UK. And, uh, yeah, these are uh, quite interesting to see up close and personal, if not uh, mm. very loud as well. But uh, I'm sure Jonathan Warner's probably got about 6.5 billion or photos least, of these least, aircraft yeah. in his uh, collection. So, Nev, uh, the next story uh, is for you. It is, yes. And uh, I've turned my volume down again. That's oh, hello. Weird, wasn't it? Sorry. <laughs> um, this is uh, on the flightglobal.com website, one of our favourites. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it says that Korea Airspace Industries is forging ahead with sales efforts in the international advanced jet trainer light attack market with the FA-50 after a stinging loss in the USA's TX competition. Uh, Sang Choi is executive vice president and general manager of uh, KAI Business Division. Uh, he's a veteran of the company's overseas sales campaigns for the T-50 advanced jet trainer and its FA-50 light attack variant. Uh, he spoke with Flight Global uh, at the recent Seoul ADEX show. Uh, though the T-50 and uh, FA-50 had been broadly adopted by the Republic of Korea Air Force and had won sales in the Philippines, Indonesia, Thailand and Iraq, the program's ultimate ambition was the US Air Force's TX competition to replace the Northrop uh, T-38. Lockheed was prime in the contract uh, with a variant designed T-50A, but ultimately the deal went to a Boeing Saab team in September 2018. Uh, I can't say that losing TX has had no impact, but business is always up and down, says uh, Choi. Losing TX was just one program out of many. My job is to encourage my people to keep going, and we are focusing on FA-50. Uh, we're talking with um, Indonesia, Philippines, Argentina, and Botswana. Uh, Indonesia and the Philippines would represent follow-on buys. Uh, Jakarta operates uh, 15 T-50Ls in the uh, trainer role. It did have 16, but one crashed in 2015. Uh, Choi says that the number is not clear, uh, but that the FA-50 could potentially replace Jakarta's 15 Northrop F-5EF fighters, which uh, Syrian fleets 
data show as retired. Uh, the Philippines deal could potentially be for 12 FA50s, uh, adding to existing 12 examples. But uh, Manila wants some upgrades prior to making a decision. And uh, these include the integration of the Lockheed Martin Sniper Advanced Targeting Pod, which is a laser guided bomb. Uh, with uh, sorry, a laser guided bomb capability and the ability to uh, carry 300 gallon fuel tanks on the wings, doubling the capacity of the existing tanks. Uh, sniper pod integration is likely by the end of 2020, says Choi. Uh, he's also confident of the FA 50s prospects in Argentina, uh, an acquisition of eight aircraft. Uh, the Argentine government had already made the decision to buy eight uh, FA 50s, and we have had several serious discussions with them to finalize the configuration price and terms and conditions, says Choi. Uh, industrial uh, participation is very important, uh, so we've been talking with them. KAI will need to provide uh, financing for the Argentina deal and has been working with the South Korea's export-import banking on the matter. Uh, the sale, however, awaits the conclusion of the country's general election, which is on the 27th of October. Uh, the Botswana deal also awaits the outcome of a general election on the 23rd of October, with a potential sale of 12 aircraft. Uh, Saab has also expressed interest in this deal with the Gripen CD. They've been looking at uh, several alternatives, such as the Gripen, but I believe that they will come back to the FA-50. Uh, we'll re-engage Botswana any time right after the election, uh, he says. And uh, Choi adds that Iraq, which had received uh, 22 T501 Qs out of a total order of 24, had not has not expressed interest in additional examples. Uh, they are trying to set up their own Air Force capability. In the meantime, we're focusing on aftermarket support. Uh, Choi adds that there are other potential customers looking at the FA-50. It's a bit too early to expose their names, he says. Uh, other long-term <clears throat> excuse me, upgrades are planned for the FA-50 uh, include the addition of a beyond visual range missile, though Choi did not specify a weapon, as well as the potential addition of an air-to-air -air -air refueling probe uh, by 2050. On whether the FA-50 will receive uh, an an active electronically scanned array radar. Uh, Choi says that this really depends on customer demand. Uh, the Republic of Korean Air Force does not require this upgrade. It's not a simple decision, he says. We need to know how many future customers are looking for this. Uh, some customers are, but some aren't. And uh, although uh, there could be uh, also an export licensing issue, it's a complicated decision. If the market calls, then we'll do it. Another potential deal is Malaysia's light combat aircraft competition, which requires 12 advanced jet trainers and 24 light attack jets. Uh, the re this requirement has drawn a motley crew of contenders, including, uh, including the Chengdu Pakistan uh, Aeronautical Complex JF-17 and Hindustan Aeronautics TS uh, Light Combat Aircraft. Choi adds that the KAI and South Korea's defense sectors has the backing of Seoul as it works to sell aircraft overseas. Uh, the government pays a lot of attention to the aerospace industry and is trying to support it, he says. Whenever government officers talk with international friends, they talk about Korea, uh, Korean equipment and weapons systems. With their support, I believe that things will go well. But uh, as always with these things, um, there's lots of political wranglings and, and things that can get away, get in the way of uh, these these major sensible decisions. Uh, defense deals. <laughs> yes. So while you've been reading that story, I've been looking at the uh, the T50. Or He's the been FA rather mesmerised by, by it, if I'm and, honest. Uh, I, I've li I've literally been watching him put him put one hand over one eye, and then like, <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what you've been doing for the last. Couple for, the, of days. for those of you listening or watching, if you if you Pull up a picture of an F-16 and pull up a picture of this this T-50 or F F-50 uh, side by side, and, and this this the aircraft that Nev's been talking about looks like a squashed F-16. Do you not think, Armando? If you look at these, if you look at the <laughs> the tail end and the, and the front end of of this T-50, it just looks like someone's got an F-16 chopped the middle out and joined it back together to make a small done a cut and shot yeah cut right. and shot yeah, yeah. <laughs> well i love that the great minds think alike because the entire time that was reading i was like what does that remind me of 
And I went the other way with it. So I, I guess it's like a cloud where you see a bunny and I see a, a cotton ball. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I think it, it looks like a, like a gnat. It looks like a T1 gnat or, uh, or the movie Hot Shots. I had to look up what, what airplane was it in Hot Shots? Oh. And it was a, it was a, the gnat <laughs> and it was a Marchetti S2, or S211, yeah. Uh, essentially, this conversation has got to both me and Nev with stuff just flying over our heads going, what, what on earth are you talking about? Can you not see that, Matt? Yeah. When, you look, when you look at the F-16, <laughs> on my picture here, yeah. right, you look at the tail end. Right, okay. Yeah, and you look at the tail end, same. And look at the front. Well, very the, different colors for a start. Different, well, yeah, it's a different <laughs> color, but it's essentially, if I mean, honestly, for those of you guys, what you should need to get a picture of the T right, fifty okay. and the F sixteen yeah. side by side. And just um, you know, I mean, of course, a decent <laughs> podcast host would have sent me to sent me those pictures while you did the, the, that. That was on the on the on, on the on the cuff. Uh, right. Um, yes. It yes, research. Anyway, was. Uh, yes. Well, uh, it was a very serious story that we just took into. What does this look like to you? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> essentially, yeah. That will be a new segment on the show. Did, did what does do this that? aircraft? Look Look like yes. to you. What does it make you look? Yes. <laughs> Yeah. So Ned, it's, it's grey. Next it's question. Gray, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, so that's uh, that's all for the military news this week. But uh, Nev, you've got uh, something for our listeners to maybe watch this week as uh, as something that uh, with uh, PTUK have found on the YouTube world. Yeah, it, it, this is uh, obviously you know on YouTube that, that there's full of aviation stuff, isn't there? But uh, this was really interesting. Um, there's a video which was filmed at uh, Lufthansa Technic in Malta, and it focuses on focuses on a complete overhaul of an Airbus A330 and shows just what's involved in this mammoth task including the removal of flaps engines and the complete interior of the uh, wide-bodied aircraft well we're going to put a link to this in the show but um, this uh, this recent project uh, which is Kilo Romeo which is a 300 series uh, A330 uh, c- causes uh, a maximum of 25,000 man hours to complete this task and obviously time is a critical issue as the aircraft is already scheduled for the next flight so from now until uh, the end of the work the team has only 40 days to deliver as good a new uh, aircraft Uh, this is about a 50 minute documentary and it's definitely worth looking at because it's uh, a fascinating insight into uh, stripping one of these aircraft down into uh, almost nothing and and, uh, maintaining it and and putting it all back together it's uh, a really well uh, made documentary actually well, and, and interesting off the back of obviously what we were talking about mm. earlier with Ryanair and everybody, you know, like you know, essentially get the opportunity to see what they're sent away to to have done. It's it's amazing. I mean, I won't spoil it for those of you watching, but one of the most surprising things for me when I watched this video was just what goes into these uh, complete overhauls because mm. they literally do strip nuts and bolts the strip it right entire down, yeah. interior of this aircraft, mm. and I mean everything. Yeah right out of the aircraft yeah, it's yeah. it's really good so yeah yeah well matt will put the uh, link to the video yep, yeah, in I the will. show notes yep. uh, so if you're listening you can uh, click on that and watch that watch uh, the documentary yeah, yeah. this week really good yeah so it's uh, time to uh, wrap up ladies and gentlemen uh we we've got um a couple of things that we just want to sort of talk to you about really uh the first uh, one for me actually is we're doing uh we're planning to do a uh, sort of Remembrance uh, Sunday sort of special program uh, that we want to release around about the same time and really this is a plea to all our wonderful podcast listeners uh, I need your help basically so uh, I need you to get in touch basically and sort of tell me what Remembrance Day means to you and perhaps if you've got any uh, family members uh, that, that were around at the time uh, we, we're desperate really to sort of get some interviews uh, and, so, and have a chat with a few people really to try and get a picture about you know obviously you know try and get the the, the people involved um you know about this 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 awful time i know armando is working on a piece for me also as part of this special program so uh we would love for you to get in touch and say you can do it by whatsapp on as i say plus four four seven five seven two two four nine one six six uh or you can go to the website plain talking uk.com search for us on social media searching for plain talking uk but our email also is podcast at plain talking uk.com as I say, we're sort of really appealing for uh, anybody who's uh, able to sort of help us uh, put together this special program that we want to do. As I say, uh, remembering um, obviously a sad time in our history. But uh, if I think anybody's... some of most of us are all lucky, or you know, some of us are lucky enough to have grandparents and, yeah. and nannies and granddads who, you know, who have um, memories mm. and, and stuff. Uh, I know I have of this particular time, yeah. and uh, it'd be great to hear of some of those uh, memories that uh, that you've 
possibly have been told by uh, by your uh, your grandparents. Absolutely. So uh, yeah, do do get in touch with the show podcast at plaintalkinguk dot com. So that's where we are going to start to bring the show to a close. But before we do, we'll have a quick run round of uh, what's going on in the next week with the host. So Nev, let's start off with you. Nev, I take it you're um, you're you're going to take a bit of a back seat to flying this week, as you've sort of been on most <laughs> most you know, most aircraft, most aircraft this, yeah, week. Mm. this week. <laughs> yes, I'm just just looking at my diary, and there's lots of London activity oh. going on, and and Kingston upon Thames, and, and oh, stuff dear. like that. But uh, no flying for me this week. But I'll be back in the air uh, the following week. <clears throat> Quick trip to Belfast again. Um, but um, as it's um, it's my birthday on Friday mm. of next week. Woo-hoo! I won't be on the show, no. unfortunately, because oh. uh, I should be down down the local pub. Right, uh, right, um, okay. I mean, live link up. <laughs> yes, I said, no, I don't think so. so <laughs> well, if if there was any kind of four G action down right. there, we could try that. But no, um, no uh, there there isn't any. Fortunately. No. Fortunately, uh, but it was the I think, pub yeah, that uh, you and I went to, uh, Matt and Carlos. When oh, you brilliant! Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, 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 absolutely. The, uh, the, the nosh and the uh, drinks will be very nice. Mm. So, uh, but uh, no, back to normal kind of work uh, next week. No. So, so no uh, Nev next week then. Uh, Armando, what about you? Are you able to join us next week? Uh, that is the week that we'll have to see. So, okay, on <laughs> Sunday. I'm off to Colorado to fly a Baron for 10 days. Oh, wow. As you do. <laughs> Beach Baron. However, the weather is looking pretty terrible. It's already snowing up there in Colorado. Right. So good, good. from, uh, yeah, Sunday through Wednesday, it looks like it's going to be snowing every day with with winds and clouds, and that's just not ideal for any kind of flying. So, oh, okay. uh, if, so you know, we'll see. So you've got a busy uh, 10 days coming up then by the, by the look of it. Uh, and uh, Carlos, what are you up to? Next week. Oh, I've, uh, we've got lots of uh, stock taking to do next week, oh, unfortunately, lovely. in my warehouse. But right. uh, we've uh, we've got a very busy November coming up. We've got, um, I think we've got five or six events in London coming okay. up in November. So it's very, very busy for us mm. uh, at, uh, at my least favourite one of my least favourite places, the Olympia in London. Oh, right, OK. Yeah. Um, but we have got one at the Birmingham NEC, and I do ah. like the Birmingham NEC. Yeah, it's nice and easy to, yeah, it's nice it's and easy to get Shame about where it is, really. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's easy to get to. But no, I shall be... It's uh, quite easy for us, actually, from this side. From it? this side, yeah. Uh, mm. But I shall be uh, just uh, chilling out in the office and looking at the general aviation that uh, tends mm. to fly in and around my area, which I'm lucky to have. So, Matt, uh, I'm guessing you'll be coaching your way across the yeah, mean d- streets of England. Yeah, I, I don't really know what's going on this week yet. Uh, all you can I know, work for me then. Uh, no, 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 I, no okay. I will be working. Oh, okay. Calm down. Uh, but no, I, I know Monday I, I'm uh, I, I'm sort of doing local uh, work. I've got school, school runs and then, then a job sort of in between local. Uh, after that, I don't really know next week yet. Uh, it's very exciting. I've just been looking at the cameras and realised that I spilt my tea down Lovely. the front of my shirt. I thought that, 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 that I was thought a bit you of an were oops, saving wasn't it? that for yeah, later. Yeah, saving that for later. So mm. uh, apologies to those watching on YouTube. I've essentially <laughs> got dinner down my T-shirt. Sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. Do you not find it? Do you find it hard, Matt, in this current weather situation we have here? Like with me, I spent a good hour, hour, hour and a half, uh, beginning of this week, cleaning the vehicle I drive, only to have it ruined. The day after. In, yeah, we're just by going to the end of the road and back, yes. essentially. I mean, this week they haven't been out much, so uh, we've been concentrating. We basically, when we, when we aren't busy, we, we valet uh, the inside valet. and the outside of the coach. So actually, uh, my coach, I've been giving a, a little coat of polish to this I don't suppose you have that, that issue, do you, Armando, when you're flying? You know, when you're flying, you, you get into <laughs> a, a clean aircraft, and regardless of what the weather's doing, you land and you get out of a clean aircraft. Yeah, but the smile makes up for it. Ah, that's a good point. Good I mean, point. I mean, Nev obviously has to polish his banana regularly. He does. Uh, <laughs> well, yes, um, but, it's, it, but it's a bit, a bit damp uh, today yeah. and, and tomorrow. I think it's going to be. But uh, Sunday looks better. I'm pleased to say it does. It does absolutely. Uh, it does. It. Uh, well, fret not. As I say, although we we may, we may not have Armando, and we also we we definitely haven't got Nev. We may not have our number. We'll line up some... uh... But next week, we do have some very special guests joining us. Uh, Now, uh, if anybody's listened to the Seat 1A podcast, I'm sure there will be people in podcast land who have listened to it. Uh, So uh, Jeff 
Dan Vinod are joining us next week, which is very exciting. So looking forward to chatting to them uh, with our various uh, ways of getting in touch. Do please send in any questions you have. Um, as I say, they're going to be here live. Well, not here, but uh, down the line <laughs> uh, live next week. So uh, join us, uh, please, for that on Friday. So that's where we're going to come or bring to a close episode number 292 of the Plain Talking UK podcast. Just want to thank everyone in the live YouTube chat room this evening for joining us. Thanks for taking time out of your Friday to uh, be with us here on the live show tonight. And also not forgetting everyone as well who downloads the show as an audio podcast. Thanks to you for downloading the show. And don't forget if you do download via iTunes, do the little reviewy thing and the starry thing and click on the stars and... Leave us a review. That was brilliantly described, Carl. I know. Thank you for that. I know. <laughs> I've done it for all the podcasts that I listen to. It took me ages, believe me. Right, Because yeah, there are many bet. podcasts yeah, are many that I listen to. That you listen to. But no, t- uh, yeah, thanks for that. And uh, yeah, and thanks to everyone who uh, yeah, has uh, joined us. And don't forget, have a great weekend, whatever you're yep. doing. Enjoy your Sunday roasts when you have them on Sunday. <laughs> so from me, Carlos here, and Matt here in the P2K studios, and from Armando and Nev, let's all say... Goodbye. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.